Welcome to South Point Church Online. We want to say hi wherever you're watching from today. And if you happen to be new, we're so glad that you chose to join us today. My name is Matt, and I'm part of the team here at South Point. I'm so excited. We're in week two of a series called Down But Not Out. And last week, we discovered something together that is really true regardless of where you're at on the faith spectrum. It doesn't matter whether you kind of are going, I don't really know about this God Jesus thing, or maybe you had a different tradition growing up, or, or maybe you've gone to church all your life. This is true about all all of us, and we're going to put it on the screen. This is what we talked about last week. Disappointment can drive us to drift to unwanted destinations. Listen, last week we talked about how 2020 has been a dumpster fire, right? And for most of us, we've had a lot of disappointment compressed in a few months. And we discussed how disappointment can drive us to disengage, and we end up in destinations that we don't want to be. And then this is where the news got good, is that we were all willing to admit a truth about all of us, and it's this right here. Drifting to an unwanted destination doesn't make you weak, it makes you human. The good news is this isn't a you issue or a me issue, this is a we issue. If you've ever drifted due to disappointment, that doesn't make you bad, it just makes you normal, which led us to something that all of us need to hear, and it's this right here. You and your life are worth the fight. You and your life are worth the fight. That's why at South Point, we say you matter deeply to God. We don't care why you showed up today. We don't care where you've been and what's been done. We believe God not only says that you're worth the fight, but God demonstrated, he showed us this. God broke heaven's bank and he sent Jesus who willingly took my place and your place and our place and paid the penalty for our brokenness on the cross and then he conquered hell and and death. And we talked about how over the next several weeks, we're going to talk about how we need to fight for our hearts, and then how we need to fight for our friends, and fight for our spouse, and then fight for our children. Now, if you happen to miss last week, no worries. You can go onto our website or onto our YouTube, and you can watch on demand there. Hey, this week we want to tackle the thing that we have to tackle first, because if we don't tackle this first, then nothing else really works, and it's our heart. And this morning, I want to kick off with a truth that's a reality that you've seen in other people and that you've experienced personally. I'm going to put it up on the screen, and it's this. The demands of life often take pieces of our heart till there's nothing left. I'll never forget when I first became a pastor, there was another pastor, and he says, when everyone's emergency becomes your emergency, you're no good for any emergency. And when I ended up in the hospital, I realized that this is true. The demands of life will often take pieces of a heart till there's nothing left. You see, life can be so demanding that it will consume as much of our heart as we allow with no thought to our own well-being. Matter of fact, as I was thinking about how to describe this, I made this little slide and, and I wanted to show you this morning. I mean, think of all the things that take space up in our heart and demand on our heart, right? First, there's family, right? You might have a brother, or sister, an aunt, or an uncle, a grandparent, a parent, an adult child. We all have family. The old saying says, you can pick your friends, but not your family, right? We have family and we have school. And it's not just if you're in middle school or high school or college, right? For some of us, your job might require you to go back to school. For some of you in the military, you might have to take schooling to continue your education. And for some of you in your trade or something that isn't college related, you still have to go to do school and do training. And then there's responsibilities. Listen, after the age of five, you realize your dinner doesn't make itself, your clothes don't watch itself, right? Your car doesn't gas itself. We have responsibilities to make life happen. And then we have friends. And the more friends we have, the greater demand upon our heart. And then there's this thing called work, right? Where we go to every day and we have crazy coworkers and we have, we have baddie bosses. Just ask my staff team, right? We have this work thing and we have marriage. And like, I want to stop here on marriage. You know, have you ever thought about like, just kind of like the humor of marriage? You take two busted and broken people who usually fall in love with someone who has the opposite thing that they like but kind of dislike and then they get together and add their families and then they try to have kids and stick it out. I mean marriage takes a demand and then there's money managing our bills and if we don't manage it it will manage us right and in parenting last week I said it's the only job that you can give 110 percent and still feel inadequate and then there's just taking our health and these even aren't all the things 
And so the demands of life don't create a full heart of health. The demands of life often fill our hearts with chaotic clutter. Let me say that one more time. The demands of life don't leave us with a full heart. The demands of life often leave our heart filled with chaos and clutter. And so this morning, as we move ahead, we need to be honest about what I call three grown-up truths. And sometimes when you're an adult, you just need to call it like it is. And so for us to be able to move forward, to be able to fight for hearts, we need to address and admit these three grown-up truths. And here's the first one we're going to put up on the screen. A world with flawed people and broken systems naturally damages our heart. Listen, I want to say something. Listen, maybe you're one of those people here today, and you just had great parents. You had a great mom and a great dad. But here's what I know to be true. No matter how great your parents were, they weren't perfect. They were flawed, and they probably created damage in your heart. Listen, no matter how good your friends are, they're not perfect. They have flaws. They've probably created damage in your heart, right? No matter how talented your coworkers or your boss or the people that you work with, they're still imperfect people, and they've probably created damage in your heart. Listen, no matter how amazing your spouse is, listen, you married them, you love them, you do it all over again, but they're also flawed and they're not perfect. And if there's anybody that can damage it's our hearts, it's our spouse. And no matter how precious our children are, right? We love our children. They are precious, right? And, and we think the word of them. But listen, nobody knows better than us how busted and broken our kids are, right? And so listen, the reality is a world with flawed people and broken systems naturally damages a heart. I mean, if you think about it, if the world systems are designed by flawed people and then run by flawed people, we can't ask systems designed and run by flawed people to deliver the right results. And so if we're really honest, the thing that we need to admit this morning is, in a world with flawed people and broken systems, we'll naturally end up with a damaged heart, which leads us to another grown-up truth out of that, and it's this. A damaged heart leads to damaged behaviors. It's the old saying that hurt people hurt people, which is so true. I think back to when I was about 18 or 19, and it's where I have one of my greatest regrets in life. Because of my brokenness, my insecurities, my selfishness, my own brokenness and woundedness, I made a really, really bad, hurtful choice, and I ended up hurting someone I deeply care about. And here's what we all know to be true. A damaged heart leads to damaged behavior. And listen, our damage in our heart may explain our damaged action and our damaged behavior, but it never excuses it. So the world with flawed people and broken um, systems damages our heart, and a damaged heart leads to damaged behaviors, which leads us to the third truth that we really need to admit today, and it's this. At the heart of our problems is our heart. Listen, I get it. Sometimes in life, we'll face the unexpected. And sometimes in life, we get the unfair. But if we're really honest about the brokenness surrounding our life and the problems that we have, at the heart of our problems is our heart. No lie, about two days ago, I was sitting around the dinner table with my family, and it's one of the things that I've gotten right as a parent. We regularly have dinner together as a family. And dinner was over, and I was talking to one of my daughters. She's 20. And she was talking about a friend that she was having difficulty with and who was in a tough place. And this friend of hers had lost all of their friends. And then my daughter for 20 year old said something really profound. She goes, I don't get it. Don't they get it? Don't they realize they are the common denominator in all the relational problems? Maybe it isn't everyone else, maybe it's them. And I looked my daughter in the eye and said, that is some profound wisdom. You see at the heart of our problems is our heart. And see, when we realize these grown-up truths about life, it leads us to something. And this is where we have the good news. It's kind of like the good news that we had last week. And is this, is that we're not alone. This isn't just a me issue. This isn't a you issue. This is a we issue. This isn't even a church issue. This is an issue that every human being will face, regardless of whether they have no faith or different faith, or you grew up as a follower of Jesus. This is something that we'll all deal with. Matter of fact, there was someone thousands of years ago. He was uh, one of the wisest people uh, to have existed. He wrote a bunch of writings, and he is actually a king, and his name is King Solomon. And God had given him wisdom to write down for future generations. And he actually addresses this because this has been a problem since the beginning. And matter of fact, he writes these words in Proverbs 4.23. We're going to put it up on the screen, and it's this. 
Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. I mean, in one sentence, he's gonna capture this whole message that I'm gonna spend 30 or so minutes trying to talk about, right? Above all else. And what he's saying is, the first thing first is you have to fight for what's on the inside. And then he says, guard your heart. Well, the only reason you would need to guard your heart is because it's under attack. And then he says, everything you do flows from it. And what he's trying to say is, the reason you need to put it first is because it's under attack, but your life as a result if, is a result of what's on the inside. And then along comes the greatest teacher to ever live, and his name is Jesus, God's one and only son, who showed up and lived a perfect life and died on a cross and conquered hell and death. And he comes along and he supports us and he actually clarifies what this means. We see this in the eyewitness account of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus addresses this very issue. And he says this, he says, A good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is identified by its fruit. You see, Jesus is trying to tell us the truth that we see in nature. He says something like this, listen, you can call something whatever you want. But whatever's on the inside will always show up on the outside. He says, things are never gathered from thorn bushes and grapes are not picked from bramble bushes. He's saying, listen, it doesn't matter what you say is on the inside. Whatever's on the inside will naturally show up and reveal what's on the inside. And then he goes on to say this. He says, he says, a good person produces good things from the treasury of a good, maybe you just want to type that in chat, a good heart. Maybe we just all need to type heart in the chat, from a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say flows from what's in your heart. And here's Jesus is saying, at the core of what's on the outside of our life, the, the, the expression of our life will always start on the inside. So both the, one of the wisest people and the greatest teacher reveal a truth about life. And matter of fact, we're gonna put it up on the screen and it's this right there. The health of our life is directly determined by the health of our heart. You see, the life that we want, the life that we're meant for, is only possible when we have a healthy heart. You see, the life that we want and the life that we need comes from what is coming on the inside our heart. You see, not only does life and reality, your experience and my experience, like I'm not telling you something that you don't know, your life experience, what you've seen tells you this truth. And then God comes along and reminds us of this truth. So we have both life and God revealing this truth. And it leaves you and it leaves me and if we're really honest, it leaves we asking one of life's most important questions today. And I want to put it up on the screen. And here's one of the life's most important questions. How do we? How do you? How do I? How do we have a healthy heart in a world that's constantly creating unwanted damage? Remember the grown-up truths? We need a healthy heart. We need a good heart so that we can have the life that we're meant for. But if life that we live in and the world is busted and broken and is always damaging a heart, then how do we have a healthy heart while it's always getting damaged? The life that we want and the life that we need comes from that answer. And this is where, this is where the news gets even better. And this is one of the reasons that I love God. It's one of the reasons that I'm a follower of Jesus. You see, God knew that this would be an issue for every single human being in every generation. Did you know that God made a promise that he would solve this problem that we couldn't solve on our own? There was this guy, his name is Ezekiel. Uh, he was a part of a community, and this community was a nation, and this nation was called Israel, right? And God had spoken and used this nation, and the idea was to have this nation kind of represent him, but they had this problem. The world was busted, they were broken, and so they had damaged hearts, and damaged hearts eventually led to damaged behavior. And this broke God's heart. And so God speaks to Ezekiel and Ezekiel reminds them and he reminds you and I of a promise that God made thousands of years ago. And here's what it is. He says, I will give you a new heart. He's saying, listen, I get that you have a damaged heart. I, I get that like life that, that will hurt, hurt you, that there's, you know, no one's perfect and there's flawed systems. And, and that as you go through life, no one gets through life without scars. He goes, I'm going to give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And we can understand why we'd have hearts of stone, right? Like when you get hurt often enough, when there's enough scar tissue, you can no longer feel, and you have a heart that's like stone. 
And what we really need to live the life that we were meant for and the life that we want is that we need a heart of flesh. And this is the whole reason that Jesus showed up is so that we could experience not change on the outside of our lives. That's religion. And the people that had the most problem with Jesus were the religious people because they were always worried about the outside. And Jesus says, you don't get it. You don't fix the outside to work on the inside. You fix the inside so that the outside will take care of itself. Matter of fact, Jesus says these words, and we're going to put it up on the screen. Uh, it's Jesus of Nazareth. It's in Matthew. He says, come to me, all. And here's what I love about Jesus is Jesus didn't exclude anyone. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Hey, has life dinged your heart? Has life left scar tissues? Are you carrying wounds that everyone has in life? Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in, what's that word? Heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You see, there was something so amazing in Jesus' heart. There was something in the heart of Jesus that was so full of love and power that even physical death could not defeat him. And Jesus says, listen, when you're tired and you're weary and your heart is damaged and it's full of the clutter of chaos because of the demands of life, what you need is you don't need religion on the outside. What you need is a heart that is alive on the inside. You need a new heart. And that's what Jesus offers you and I. And so how do we practically experience this heart that Jesus wants to give us? How do we have a heart that moves from a heart of stone to a heart that is alive and good and full of life, a heart of flesh? And so this morning, I want to give us three practical things that regardless of where you're at on the faith spectrum, that anyone could take these steps. And they're kind of in order, and I could spend weeks on each of them, but I'm just going to give you an overview this morning. And so how do we move from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh? And so here's the first thing that we need to do practically, and I'm going to put it on the screen. Our hearts need healing. You see, our hearts need healing. None of us get a pass through life. If you've lived enough life, it might have been a parent, a grandparent, it might have been a friend, it might have been a boss, it might have been a coworker, it may have even been a pastor. But at some point, all of us carry wounds on the inside of us. Our hearts need healing. And here's what you know to be true. Time does not heal wounds addressing hurts does. You know what I've discovered? Listen, I've been working with people for a long time. Time healing wounds is a myth. You know what all time does? Time just allows things to rot. Time just allows for envy. Time just allows for envy. And all time really does is build bitterness up in our heart. You already know this. You know this. You've experienced this. Time doesn't make you feel better. All it does is harden the hurt that has already happened. We need to address the hurt. And here's where it gets a little bit confusing. As human nature, to address our hurt, we always chase things will, that will actually never provide the healing we need. Here's what I mean. Think, think about this, right? Like, think about life. What are the things that we chase, right? Like, we chase success, right? We want to be good at our careers. Um, we want to be famous. And so I want to ask a question. Have you ever known someone who's really successful but carries many wounds and still needs healing? Of course, because no matter how much success you have, success doesn't heal wounds. Think about people that have been famous. And I bet you can think of actors and singers who've been very famous, but carried such deep wounds that it was hard for them to make it through life. We chase money. We think if we have money and we can have things, that it'll heal the inside. And yet the truth is we all know people with or without money, right? That carry deep wounds. Sometimes we think if we chase pleasure, the feel goods that somehow it will heal our wounds. And if we're honest, we have all known or been that person that's chased pleasure. And instead of healing wounds, it's just created more. So in our chase, in humanity's chase of, of success and of wealth and of, of money and of fame and of pleasure, we found that those things over history, it's a fact, they don't heal wounds. Addressing hurt does. And so one of the things that I love to tell people and I want to tell you today, if you're here and you feel like you have wounded heart, I've only seen one thing in all of human history that has the power to transform and heal someone from the inside out. 
And I know this to be true of me because I've experienced a lot of woundedness, you know, abuse, abandonment, my mom took her own life. Like I could go on and on about the hurt in my own heart. And I know what transforms someone who used to hurt people because I was hurt. And there's only one thing, and it is the unconditional love of God found not in a church, not in a religion, not in a pastor, but in a person named Jesus in a real relationship. Understanding God's unconditional love comes from the fact that you were made to be his daughter or his son. And God doesn't love you because you're good enough or you earned it or you got to clean your life up. God loves you right where you are. He sent his son to die and conquer hell and death for you. That is unconditional love and it's the only thing that can take a heart of stone and transform it into a heart of flesh wounds don't heal themselves addressing the hurt does so I want to take a second to address people that have already said yes to Jesus that might be churchgoers or consider themselves um, people who go to church I just want you to know this going to church and listening to a message doesn't always create healing addressing our hurt does. So at South Point, we have a couple of resources. We have a budget. If you're in crisis and you need counseling, we have a crisis counseling budget to help people in need. Listen, no one should ever be ashamed of hurts or wounds because we all have them. And so addressing those things is something that we should do. We have something called Stephen's Ministry. Now, they're not counselors, but they are Christians who will walk alongside you in a difficult and hard season as you deal with these things. We also have a small group called Celebrate Recovery. It walks alongside people like me and like you because all of us have habits and hurts and hangups that create damage in our life because of the damage done to us. So our hearts need healing. I wanna say something, time will not heal those wounds. Addressing the mess will. Which leads us to the next two things that we need to do. And here's number two, our hearts need nurturing. I was thinking about how to explain this, and I'm sorry for my sports analogy, but junk food diets don't lead to Olympic performances. I don't know about you, but I always am interested and intrigued by high-performance people. I don't care if they're athletes or speakers or in fields, electricians, like, I don't care. I'm just, when people are excellent at their craft or the skill, I'm like, how do they perform at such a high level? And Olympic athletes know this. They know this truth. And you know it, and I know it. We just don't always practice it, right? Input equals, maybe you want to type in the chat, what's going to come up next? Output, right? That's why high-performing high Olympic athletes almost always have a dietitian because they realize <coughs> that what they put into their body um, directly um, impacts their output. And if it's true for our physical bodies, isn't that true for our souls? And here's where it becomes so, so important. Like, listen, do not check out. I need everyone to take a second. Just, I need you to stop. Maybe if the kids are playing or there's like an ad showing or something, I need, need you to stop and focus. And here's what I want to say. Our hearts need nurturing, and, and here's why. You showed up today, and you showed up today, and you probably want to be good at your job. If you showed up today, you probably want to be a good friend. If you showed up today, you probably want to have a good marriage. If you showed up today, you probably want to be a good parent. And if you showed up today, you're probably going, I want to be a good person. But here's the problem. And here's the truth that you know and I know that we rarely ever say out loud. You can't give what you don't have. And our effort to be a good friend and to be good at our jobs and to be a good person and to be a good spouse and to be a good parent requires unconditional love because those that we love and engage with and touch in the world will eventually damage and hurt us. And so to be able to be the good that we want, we need to have something on the inside that we don't possess to give, which is called unconditional love. And you can't give what you don't have. So that's where the input comes in from. What kind of input? And so like, listen, listen, I, I'm on Instagram. Like every once in a while, I'll binge a show like on Netflix, right? Like I like a good movie, right? Every once in a while, I'm on Facebook, right? Like I get that. But I want to say something. If the primary inputs in our life are Instagram and Netflix and the radio station and your favorite news channel, is that a healthy diet for your soul? Because junk food diets don't lead to Olympic performances. I want to ask the question, where is God's grace? Where are God's promises? Where are God's truths? Where's wholeness and goodness? Having an opportunity to have an input into your life. You know, today is small group connect. Do you have any friends that you're connecting with to help you walk through this life? Where do you take time 
And not, I mean take time, make time, because you never find it, there's no extra time, to talk to God in prayer. Or maybe take a few minutes, make time to read God's promises so that we can hear that there's a God who loved us and made us and wants to be our friends. At the end of the day, we'll never have the kind of life we want if we have a junk food input because input always equals output. See, we need to nurture our heart. Remember what the wisest man said? He says, everything flows from it. Jesus tells us that what happens on the outside is a result of what's happening on the inside. And so we need to make sure that we're nurturing, that we're having something good come in so that when life kind of hits us, that what spills out of us is God's unconditional love and his goodness and his right and his true so that we experience the life that we want and the life that we're meant for. Which leads me to observation number three that we need to practice. Our heart needs protecting. Without care, our hearts end up callous. I told you last week over the last four years um, that I trained four times a week uh, for powerlifting. Um, and I wasn't really good at it, but it was a hobby, right? And the thing that happened is, is when you go to the gym and you grab the bars, the bars all have these like sharp little um, spikes on them so that you can hold on to them when your hands are sweaty. And that's why they closed gyms because they wanted everyone to be healthy, right? And what happens is, is when you hold those bar enough, it tears up your hand. And when you tear up your hands enough, you get calluses because of the damage there. Well, one night we were at the dinner table, like I was saying, it's a family tradition, and uh, my girls are older, but every once in a while I still try to grab their hands, and one of my daughters, she always washes her hands before dinner, so she always closes her fist, so I kind of like grab her arm, and one day I grabbed her arm, and she kind of pulled, and uh, my calluses scratched her, and she said, ow, dad, what is in your hand? I said, oh, those are just calluses, and I think that's a great picture of life. You and I go through life, and life damages us, and if we don't care for our hearts, we end up with calluses that end up hurting other people. Now, I want to say something a little bit harsh and, 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 and something that's true, so I, I want you to stick with me, but sometimes truth helps us to take steps that we wouldn't take unless someone told us the truth, right? And so listen, we need to find middle ground between being self-absorbed. I bet all of us know someone who's just into themselves. Self-care is their thing. They only care about themselves and they're all about like, I just need to take care of me. Well, that's not self-care, that's just being self-absorbed. And then we all know other people who are always there for other people, but never never really taking care of themselves, and that's self-destructive. And you and I need to find some kind of middle ground between being self-absorbed and self-destructive, and that's called self-care. Now, I love living in our community, and I understand that we have people who watch from different countries and different parts of the country, right? But here in our little community, uh, what's amazing is during this pandemic, uh, if you stop by Lowe's or go out, you'll see people doing home projects. You see people waxing their car. You see people mowing their lawns with their nice little neat uh, lawn lines, and they're all doing these home projects, and you, you see it on Instagram. And here's my question. Do we work harder to make our home beautiful, our cars beautiful, and our yard's beautiful, while our soul is broken. What good is a neatly manicured home? What good is a neatly manicured yard or a neatly manicured card when our souls are messed up? If our yards and our house and our cars look better than our soul, that's dysfunctional. At some point, we have to get some rest. We have to take a day off. We have to do something that's just more than rest. We have to have restoration. We have to have some kind of care. You've been on an airplane probably. What's the first thing they tell you? If there's an emergency and the mask comes down, before you put it on the child, you put it on, maybe type it in, yourself, right? Because you can't help somebody else when you're knocked out. Without care, our hearts end up callous. So if I was gonna sum up today's message in like one sentence for us to share, I would say it this way. The life we want starts by fighting for our hearts. See, I know that you showed up this morning because you have a life that you want. You showed up today because maybe you believe there's a God who has a life that you're meant for. And we're all trying to get to where we're supposed to be. But we'll never ever get to where we're supposed to be unless we fight for our hearts first. Because the life on the outside is always dictated by what's on the inside. 
I wanna close with an analogy uh, that really happened. Uh, as most of you know, interest rates are low, so my wife and I are in the middle of refinancing our house. We got an appraisal, and before the appraiser came out, I wanted to clean up the yard, and so I was doing a bunch of yard work, and I noticed that our beds, um, and we have large beds around our house, right, were all full of weeds, which was really shocking to me because just several months ago, I had paid someone to remulch all of our beds and to put new mulch down. And what I discovered was, as I was remulching these beds, that there were two problems. One is they had only put a thin covering of mulch. And the second thing is they hadn't taken care of the weeds. They just covered up the weeds with a small layer of mulch. And the problem with that is the weeds that were there weren't taken care of. And so what was underneath just came up and showed through. And I think that's a great picture of two groups of people. Sometimes as church people, we try to throw a layer of Jesus on top of the weeds of our heart and hope that it takes care of it instead of addressing our hurts. And if we're really honest, and maybe we haven't said yes to Jesus, maybe we're kind of exploring this whole faith thing, we try to cover our lives with success and money and pleasure and fame, only to discover we haven't addressed what's on the inside. And we can both of us be guilty, those who haven't said yes to Jesus and those that have, that we really haven't taken care of what's on the inside. And what's on the inside will always show up on the outside. So as I was working on this yard, I had to remove all the old mulch, dig up and get rid of all the weeds so that when I put the new mulch on, I just wouldn't have the same problem later. The life we want and the life we're meant for means that we have to fight for our heart. And today, I wanna to give three challenges. I wanna talk about how do we heal our heart, I wanna talk about how do we nurture our heart, and how do we protect our heart. And maybe wherever you're at today, you'll need a different one. So I'm gonna hold the healing our heart to the very end because I wanna ask something of some of you. Um, so the first thing I wanna talk about is how do we nurture our heart? And so I just wanna say, if you're here today, and you go, listen, maybe I haven't done a really good job of nurturing my heart. Like I've really kind of like, you know, I'm not in a small group. I'm not with like-minded people helping me grow who will challenge me. Maybe you could join a small group. Um, maybe if you need to nurture your heart, maybe just one simple step that you could take is download the U version. It sends you a verse a day to your phone and has a little devotional. Under four minutes, you can hear a little bit of God's promises and God's love for you. Maybe that's one simple step so that you can have some kind of input of God's love and promise and goodness in your life on a daily or weekly basis. Maybe maybe that's one small step. Um, download you version or jo join a small group. Something simple that all of us can do and we'll have some groups that are online so that we can be safe and so maybe that's the step for you. For some of you here, you need to take the step to protect your heart. You need to find that balance between self-absorbed and self-destructive. You need to discover what self-care is. You, you move too far between those two. And for you, that might be taking a full day off where you don't do any regular work. For some of you, it might be going on a date night with your spouse. Maybe you just type in date night. Just maybe you just re rekindle that thing. Take a date night. And uh, maybe for others of you, it's going for a long walk. And for some of you, it's maybe like putting down the computer or phone or, or turning off a TV show and just getting a good night's sleep. Maybe you're here today and the step that you need to do is to protect your heart. I save the best for last. All of us are here and we've probably experienced wounds in our heart and time won't heal them. And so I wanna encourage you, if you've already said yes to Jesus, then maybe you need to take a step and it might be professional counseling. It might be Stephen's ministry. It might be just getting in a small group. It might be a small group like Celebrate Recovery where we address our hurts and our habits and our hangups. And so for those of us, I wanna ask, is there a wound that's creating damage in our lives and the lives of loved ones that we need to address? And then I save the last thing for those of you, you showed up today and you've heard about Jesus, you even know about Jesus, and if you're really honest, you, you maybe even believe in Jesus, you might not be into the whole like religion thing, but like this Jesus, like you get that, like you love Jesus, the religious, and all the things that come with that, you're not into that, but you haven't said, Yes to Jesus. Your heart is scarred and it's wounded and you need the only thing that can heal it because money and fame and success and pleasure will never heal the wounds that you've received. And so today, I wanna challenge you. There'll be a little button, a little place where you can just raise your hand and say, today, today I'm gonna cross over from death to life. I'm gonna say yes to Jesus. I'm going to admit that because I have damaged, that I've damaged others. I'm gonna believe that God loves me and he sent his son and, he's, and he loves me and he wants to call me a son or daughter. And I'm gonna to commit, not to a church, not to some organization, but I'm gonna to commit to putting Jesus first. 
If that's you today, I'm gonna close in prayer and say a little prayer and ask that you would pray along with me. And for those of us who see people raising their hands, we just wanna say congratulations. You know, Jesus tells us that when we say yes to him, that we're filled with life and a new heart that may have this old shell over it, but death can no longer defeat us. Because when we fight for our hearts, we'll end up with the life that we want and the life that we're meant for. Let me pray for us. Hey God, you didn't just say that we were worth the fight. You sent your son, Jesus, and he showed us what it looked like to be fully human. And no one put him on a cross, he went there willingly. And they buried him in a tomb, but the tomb is empty. Because the love that was in his heart was so powerful, he was so good, so holy, so what was right, that even death could not hold him down. And so God, I know that there are people today who are watching this, who are gonna say yes to you. They're gonna admit that they've missed the mark. They're gonna believe that you paid the price for them and they're gonna commit to putting you first. And God, we just believe that you'll fill us with your presence and that you'll give us a new heart in place of the heart of stone. And we begin to live the life and that we'll take those other steps because you've called us to be sons and daughters. You've done what you can do. Now we need to take the step that we can do. This is our hope and our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. And we hope at South Point that you would never forget you matter deeply to God. Have a great week.